Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Undertold Stories in Archaeology Women in Texas Archaeology panel discussion. This online series is meant to provide an opportunity to highlight topics and perspectives in Texas archaeology that may be less well known to the professional community or even to the general public. I'm Becky Shelton. I'm the regional archaeologist, one of the regional archaeologists for the archaeology division of the Texas Historical Commission, and I'll serve as the moderator for the panelists today. Our panelists um, are here on um, screen with us. Um, we have Pat Mercado Ollinger, the former state archaeologist and director of the THC Archaeology Division. Kay Hines, the former city of San, Anto San Antonio archaeologist. Mary Beth Tomka, head of collections at the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory, and Tamara Walter, associate professor at Texas Tech University. We'd like to reflect for a few moments on the trailblazers that paved the way for women in Texas archaeology and to honor their legacies and major contributions to the field. The following brief profiles are by no means comprehensive, but are meant to highlight the successful leadership roles and first, our predecessors held in this discipline. You will notice a persistent theme throughout these women's careers and their collaboration with volunteer groups such as the Texas Archaeological Society, their roles as mentors through academic institutions, and their willingness to push the boundaries of research and push past accepted norms to make groundbreaking discoveries. The first lady we liked to profile was Ann Fox. She was known for her grace, candor, and encouragement when dealing with many friends, students, and colleagues. In the 1960s, she began her career in archaeology at the laboratory at San Antonio's Witte Museum. From there, she became well known for her work at the Center for Archaeological Research of the University of Texas, San Antonio. To illustrate how involved she was with the public archaeology, she served as the former president of the Texas Archaeology Society and of the Southern Texas Archaeological Association. Kathleen Gilmore. Uh, Dr. Gilmore was widely considered to be a pioneer in the field of historic archaeology, notably in her investigations of the archaeological of the archaeology of Spanish and French colonialism in Texas and Louisiana. Kathleen was a founding member of the Society for Historical Archaeology, was the former president of the organization, and in 1995 she was awarded the J.C. Harrington Award from the Society. She was the first woman honored with this award. She was a professor at the University of North Texas and later worked with Curtis Tunnell, the first Texas state archaeologist, and they worked together to identify the location of LaSalle's Fort St. Louis. Subsequently, she was integral in the rediscovery of missions, Mission Santa Cruz de San Saba. Her influence was widespread. She worked with archaeological societies on cultural various cultural resource projects and was a philanthropist to provide opportunities for research and preservation for generations to come. She was the inaugural recipient of the Curtis D. Tunnel Lifetime Achievement Award and ultimately a recipient of the Governor's Award for Historic Preservation here in Texas. Our next profile is of Deanne's story. Deanne's many first, oh, this slide is a fun one of Kay and, okay, we'll move on. Deanne's stories achieved many firsts in her archeological career. From her PhD studies at the University of California, LA in 1963 to her career in Texas with the Salvage Project and as the director of the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory. In addition to her groundbreaking book on typology for the artifacts of Texas's prehistory, Deanne directed numerous major archaeological research excavations in Texas and was a teacher and a mentor. She made profound impact on her students' lives, and she was involved with national and regional professional societies, and later on in her life was recognized with numerous awards. Ellen Sue Turner. She began her career in 1979 with a degree from University of Texas San Antonio and was a co-author of the seminal work, 
a field guide to stone artifacts of Texas Indians. This publication has become a standard reference for Texas archeologists. In addition to her research and archeological investigations, Turner contributed to the education and outreach of volunteers and individuals interested in archeology span and was a fellow and former president of the Texas Archaeology Society. She received recognition for her contributions to the field um, by receiving the Archaeological Lifetime Achievement Award from the South Texas Archaeological Association and was a recipient of the Curtis Tunnel Lifetime Achievement Award in Archaeology. Carolyn Spock. Carolyn retired from Tarle in 2011, where she served from 1977 till then, um, ultimately as the head curator of records for the laboratory. Carolyn is also known for her absolute dedication and commitment to the discipline. She began her studies in 1970 at a University of Texas Field School excavations at the George C. Davis site, which is now known as the Caddo Mayum State Historic Site. During her years at Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory, she worked with volunteers, volunteers of the, of the Archaeological Society, and it is reasonable to say that Carolyn has worked with hundreds of thousands of individuals over the years, assisting with their research, mentoring students, and mentoring professionals alike. She participated in curation related committees with the Council of Texas Archaeologists and the Archaeology Society and work to develop curation accreditation programs for state repositories. Carolyn served as the secretary and president for the Texas Archaeological Society, became the website editor, and is the keeper of all society things historical. She currently serves on the Texas Archaeological Stewardship Network Advisory Committee and provides wonderful advice and feedback to this day, to the staff. Teddy Lou Stickney. Teddy Lou's commitment to preservation highlights the importance of avocational volunteers who have made a difference in the field of archeology. span She has been, been a member of the Texas Archaeological Society since 1964. She developed the annual field school program, which is still ongoing today and was a visionary for the Texas Archaeological Awareness Week, which evolved into Texas Archaeology Month and is celebrating its 25th year. As a leader, she served as the president of the society and in 2016, she was the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award. She has shown strength of character and passion for education make for an enduring legacy. And she still serves with that on the advisory committee today. Finally, finally, we'd like to recognize Solve Turpin. Um, in the 1970s, she began research on rock art and petroglyphs during her doctoral studies, studies at the University of Texas. She, along with the director of the Texas Archaeological Survey and dozens of students, continued this groundbreaking work at Seminole Canyon, Bonfire Shelter, and Skyline Shelter. Her work on this subject continued for decades in Texas and in Mexico through the Borderlands Archaeological Research Unit underneath the Institute of Latin American Studies at the University of Texas. Her research included the bilingual publication, The Rock Art of Bohila, which was recognized internationally. She served as the Associate Director of the Texas Archaeological Survey, then the Director, and retired as Associate Director of Tarle in 1994. Retirement did not stop her career, and she led Turpin and Sons, which was a very successful private consulting firm until 2020. We'll now move on to um, the short presentations and some discussion amongst the panelists. The panelists today have committed their careers to Texas archaeology. While they have helped to carry the Trailblazers Legacies Ford, the women that we just introduced, they can, the panelists continue to pave the way and create new paths forward as leaders in our industry. Here to share their career highlights in their own words, we'll begin with Pat. Thank you, Becky. And thanks to everyone who's tuning into this uh, to hear about some pretty remarkable women that are sharing the screen with me. Um, 
so yes, I am the former state archaeologist for Texas, and uh, I will be upfront. I did not come from Texas originally. I was one of those Californians that that invaded, um, but that's where I first encountered my first um, artifacts, uh, Indian artifacts that piqued my interest, my curiosity. And thanks to a public librarian, I found out that there was an actually a, a field of study that one could pursue to better understand what these objects were and what they represented, the people that used them, the people that, that lived where I was finding these things, which interestingly enough was at my father's um, uh, job. He was a greenskeeper at a golf course and there was a beautiful creek that ran through the golf course, um, fed directly into the Pacific Ocean. And occasionally the creek would change course a little bit and expose um, deposits, cultural deposits. And so that's where I had my first um, exposure to that sort of thing. Um, I was not allowed to pick up anything because the property didn't belong to us. So from the get go, um, I didn't realize it was going to pay off later on. Uh, I had, um, you know, certainly a, a healthy respect for private property. And, uh, but uh, moving on, I was very fortunate to, to go to a high school uh, in Southern California where a teacher, a male teacher, his name was uh, J James Jenner. He was a history teacher, social studies uh, teacher. He had the opportunity to teach us uh, kind of a mini course, and he chose to teach it in anthropology, which was actually his major in, in uh, college. And he brought in speakers from the various different fields, subfields of uh, anthropology, including an archaeologist. And that's the first time I met face to face, yes, another male <laughs> archaeologist. Um, and got to talking to him after the class and he said, hey, I'm working on a project. If you want to volunteer, come on out and see if this is really, you know, something that you want to pursue. I did that. And uh, so that's, that was my first field experience. And uh, that led to some other uh, volunteer um, projects as well, including field, uh, not just field work, but lab work, which our curator on the panel, I'm sure is happy to hear. Uh, so uh, I decided to pursue archaeology. And so I went to school uh, in Arizona, got my um, undergraduate and graduate degrees there, and was encouraged. Um, but I didn't really have any mentors, to, so to speak, on staff in the, in the academic staff except for one person who actually was an adjunct professor and was also the head of the um, archaeological uh, laboratory for the National Park Service. And he's the one who really, I would consider my mentor, Keith Anderson. And from there, I moved to Texas following the guy that's responsible for my hyphenated name and had opportunities kind of, the timing was great. The timing was great. Uh, Dr. Eileen Johnson at Lubbock Lake uh, Landmark was very encouraging. I volunteered there. And from there, I was able to land jobs with the Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife um, Department, worked in the private sector, and then ultimately in the public sector. And along the way, most of the folks that encouraged me were, were male. But the, the women that she just highlighted in the slideshow were great. Uh, once I arrived at the Texas Historical Commission, they were very encouraging. They were sounding boards and I just can't say enough to, to uh, you know, I just, I really kind of regret that I didn't start my career here in Texas because I would have loved to have worked more directly with each of those individuals. So that's it in a nutshell. Pat, do you want to tell us a little bit about more your career at the Texas Historical Commission? Sure. Uh, uh, you began 
um, you didn't start off as the state archaeologist, no. but I think people would like to know about um, the evolution of your career within the within the agency. Certainly, um, I actually was hired uh, as a temporary hire to complete some National Register of Historic Places nominations. And uh, as it turned out, timing, I guess, was kind of, I must have been born under a, a lucky star because uh, when that was wrapping up, that work was wrapping up, uh, one of the staff members was leaving to finish her uh, thesis work. And so I applied for that, that position, uh, was just a staff archeologist for some time. And then um, in 1994, the state archeologist, my predecessor, Bob Maloof, who was the second state archeologist for Texas, he left to uh, pursue uh, other opportunities at Sol Ross State University. And again, um, I applied and was fortunate enough to, to land the job. Um, and then over time, as, as our agency uh, morphed uh, a bit, uh, reorganized, um, we once were separate, the state office of the state archaeologist and the review and compliance section for archaeology was a separate department that was later joined together. And um, I later on became the department head for the archaeology department, as well as the um, deputy state historic preservation officer for um, archaeology. So as many women know, we wear many hats, don't we? And th this was certainly um, another example of that. I had three titles, not three times the pay, but three titles. And I have to say one more thing. Um, it was a great experience working um, at the Historical Commission. I had great experiences every place that I worked. And I will say that, um, you know, taking taking advantage of opportunities when they present themselves was kind of my mantra and something that I would encourage others who are considering um, any path uh, in their careers to take because you never know what's really gonna lock in, uh, you know, and just work for you. So that's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> well, we're starting to get in a couple of questions. Um, in the Q&A, and this is this is a hard question for archaeologists to ask, but I'm going to go ahead and present it to Pat. What was your favorite project while you were working at the Texas Historical Commission? Uh, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> okay, well, all right, if I have to pick a favorite, I would say that um, Probably, I'd narrow it down to a region anyway. <laughs> we did several projects in the Texas Panhandle and uh, working on private property at the landowner's invitation, um, that, was, that was fantastic. And working on survey projects as well as excavations, uh, the Buried City uh, site was, was a pretty remarkable one to work on. Um, it also was the location in Ockeltree County where the Texas Archaeological Society had um, a series of field schools. So, And Pat, for the audience that may not be familiar with the name Buried City, um, tell them a little bit about what time period and what type of site y'all were investigating or, and excavating, obviously. Sure. Yeah, so the Buried City is um, a complex of archaeological sites that um, while not totally contemporaneous, there, there's certainly a range of occupations. This was a valley along Wolf Creek that attracted people over time during the late prehistoric period, say AD 1450-ish uh, and, and somewhat later. Um, what's remarkable about these sites is that many of them um, contain the remains of uh, structures where you can still see where the foundation rocks were, sometimes above ground, sometimes buried, uh, but very, very fascinating uh, to understand how those people uh, congregated 
and lived, um, bison was certainly something that they relied upon. But there's also evidence of some agricultural um, practices as well. And um, there was pottery. They were using the bow and arrow at that point. Uh, and there was a lot of um, evidence for the uh, interaction with other regions of, of, well, just other regions. There's obsidian that came in from New Mexico and uh, pottery types and other artifacts that came from the north and the east. Thank you, Pat. Yes, that is a, that's a fascinating area. And I know we'll probably revisit um, that region before the afternoon is up. Kay, would you like to give us a little overview, um, take as long as you want, of um, your career? Kay is also recently retired, um, but she has a lot to share. Yeah, thank y'all to uh, Becky, to you, and to Isabel, and to the Texas Historical Commission. And I'm, I have to say I'm really honored uh, to be a part of this today with all these wonderful women and seeing the slide pictures of so many uh, women who really greatly influenced all of us just makes my heart happy today to see some of those pictures. So my story today is probably a little bit maybe uh, along a different line from everyone's um, in the sense that um, I married very young. Um, I, was, I was out of school for about 10 years. So I didn't even start my college degree until I was 27. So I think that's probably a little bit different from everyone. And I, I always kind of loved, um, you know, history and the past and everything. And uh, what really kind of got me motivated into archaeology was that my mother-in-law at the time owned a big ranch in McMullen County. And as a junior high school student, she would take me down there with her because she loved to collect artifacts. And she had established a working relationship with Dr. Tom Hester, uh, who was then at Berkeley, uh, a graduate doctoral student out at Berkeley. So I was familiar with Dr. Hester because of Dot's relationship with him. So anyway, I, I decided at the age of 27 that I wanted to go get my degree in archaeology, anthropology. And I was so incredibly lucky because uh, Tom had started the Center for Archaeological Research out at UTSA um, uh, several, uh, probably about six or seven years before, before I started. And so I was so incredibly lucky to be able to, um, to go to school at UTSA. And um, I worked uh, closely with Ann Fox there on projects. So she was one of the uh, first female archaeologist that I really got to um, learn from and to participate with. And I have to give so much credit to Tom because he's been, he's been a mentor to so many of us and, and I know to Tamara as well. And so thanks to Tom, I think he's made a lot of career archaeologists. Um, also other great people that were there. Um, at that time, uh, they, in 1984, they hired me for the Apple White Reservoir Project to be the project historian. And that came out of a report that I had done for a class for Tom that he had passed on to Ann. And I'll never forget it because it's, sometimes it's the little small things that really influence you, right? And I remember getting my paper back from Tom and at the top of it, Ann had wrote, really impressed by this young lady, wish she lived closer so we could hire her. And that just, oh my gosh, how happy that made me, right? Anyway, they did hire me, and so I drove back and forth. My, my general um, travel was about 150 miles round trip, three days a week. And so I started doing the archival historical research for the, for the Apple White Project. And I have to say it was such a great experience. Um, this is, was on a, a, a surface water reservoir project that was planned on the south side of San Antonio. And these lands had been occupied for hundreds of years by the descendants of many of the original settlers of San Antonio. So that was my real first great exposure to getting to meet and know and form lifelong friends with many of these descendants of these original settlers. And um, it was just an incredible experience. We, we had, um, you know, some exciting times we got shot at. Um, on that project, um, a, a, a very elderly little lady who, who cared nothing about us and about archaeology uh, was not happy. <laughs> and 
that we were on our property. So you know, there are all kinds of stories you can tell about experiences that you had, right? And so I was really fortunate to work that from 1984 to 87. And then again, I was hired um, by SMU and a and to rework that project again from 1989 to 1991. And so I had, I have to say the same as, as what Pat just said, is that many of those mentors for us uh, were men, you know, who, who greatly supported us. Uh, I, I feel absolutely no amount of um, discrimination or anything for being female. These were great people. One thing I learned very early, I think, was pick really great people to work with. And when they support you and, and you work with them, they make your career so much better. And there are so many men and women um, that, that are willing to do that. So look for the good people. I think that's one of my, my words of advice. Anyway, so I, I worked that project. I met um, Adolf Hedera, who was a descendant of Jose Francisco Ruiz, and Blas Hedera, who was the messenger to Travis at the Alamo. And that was really kind of a, a profound moment for me. Adolf was a retired San Antonio firefighter, and he knew his heritage. And when he first used to try to go and say, you know, I'm a, I'm a descended from a, a signer of the Texas Declaration of Independence, you know, his story that he would tell me is that people would look at him and kind of go, yeah, right, you know. Anyway, Adolf became a very dear friend. And as part of the survey work, John Leal, who was the Bear County Archivist at the time, knew Adolf, knew me because I was coming in to do research. And he said, you have to meet Adolf at Edwin. And so we did, and, and he arranged a field trip out to his ranch as, as part of the Apple White survey. And so one of, one of my favorite projects of all time is, you know, I, I came from a very small rural town, right? And so we walked onto this property that had two standing Hakal structures. And, you know, you just don't see those hardly ever. They're very rare, particularly in Barrett County. There are only like seven left in the entire county. And leaning up against one of these hakals were these massive, massive gates. And I just thought, my gosh, what are those? And so I, you know, I talked to Adolf and I said, where did these come from? And he said, oh, they came from the, from the Alamo or one of the missions. And so that was, it, it, oh man, I just, you know, that news was just so exciting to me. So um, we got some grants uh, working with different organizations and through, through CAR. And then by that time, uh, Tom had moved on to uh, Carl in Austin. And I did the archival research for those gates. They're, they're known as the gates to the Alamo. We've never been able to 100% substantiate that, but they certainly did come from one of the San Antonio missions, no doubt. They're now on display at the Bob Bullock State History Museum. So if any of you are interested and you go to see that, please look. And I have to give such a shout out to Evie Patton, Adolph's daughter, who has continued his very rich traditions of preserving history. And we owe so much to that family for preserving these incredibly remarkable architectural, Spanish colonial architectural resources. So that was a highlight for me. Um, I also got to meet uh, Skipper Scott, with the Corps of Engineers during that project. Um, Skipper and I have remained friends for since 1984. And I was so fortunate at the city to be able to get to work with him at the Corps of Engineers while I was at the city. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later as, as well as some others. Uh, around 1993, a very dear friend of mine, Mark Wolf, who's an architect in San Antonio, called me up one day and he had just learned that his ancestor Juan Leal had been at the Mission Santa Cruz de San Saba when it was destroyed. And he said, I wanna go see it, where is it? And I said, well, that's a good question, we don't know. And I said, we know where the Presidio is, but we, we don't know where the mission is. And he said to me, he said, well, do you think we could find it? And I said, hey, let's give it a try. So we teamed up and uh, then we, we invited Dr. Grant Hall from Texas Tech uh, to join us in the search for that. It, it, it had been looked for by others. And um, so, you know, we started that search in 1993 and we were very lucky. Um, one day I happened to go down to the DRT library, shout out to the DRT people. And I found a little pamphlet by John Warren Hunter. 
and a little footnote in that little pamphlet said the site of the mission is located on the Hawkins Smith property. And so then I did deep, I picked up on um, some previous research that another historian had done and then carried that forward and found out who that land belonged to. It was Judge Otis Lickman of Menard. And so we, I called him up, we arranged then to go survey his property. And Mark and his wife, Kim, and Grant and myself went out there on a weekend. We started walking their little field and started finding Bob. And then we found um, the first shirt of leg lace wear. So we felt fairly certain then that we had the site of what was known as the missing mission of Texas. Dr. Kathleen Gilmore, that was one of the first times I really got to know Kathleen well, came and joined us in that work. Um, we also consulted, of course, with Ann Fox out at Carr. And so with Kathleen's knowledge, and she had been on a previous, uh, we did, had done some work for the previous search for that mission. I, I just cannot tell y'all how much um, support Kathleen offered to us in, in every way. And so she was just one of the most wonderful, wonderful people. And um, I was so fortunate to get to work so closely with her. And I know Tamara will tell you some things about her as well. We both loved her dearly and she was wonderful. And uh, I know Pat got to work with her too as well. So anyway, that was just a great experience um, getting to find that mission. We worked with, with THC closely, um, organizations such as the Texas Historical Foundation uh, contributed funds for our search for, for that mission. And so that is, you know, that is another great highlight for me of my story. So I think you're sort of start seeing a pattern here. Your, your career sort of becomes formed by these projects that you either you know, somehow you're fortunate to be able to get on or you luck on to or whatever. And I remember when we found the mission, I remember Grant saying, well, it was a lot of luck. And, you know, it kind of made me mad. And I thought, no, it was really good, hard, solid work. And about two years later, I said, oh, it was luck. <laughs> and it really was. So the, the field had been plowed that day. So we were lucky. Um, in 96, um, Smitty Smedlin, who, who some of y'all will know, who was a, a steward for the Texas Historical Commission and another dear friend to, to some of us. Um, he, we were at a Texas Archaeological Stewardship uh, meeting and he said, hey, I heard y'all found that mission up in Menard. He said, do you think you can come down here to Victoria and we can find the first site of the Spiritu Santo? And I was kind of cocky at that time, you know, and I said, sure. I said, so let, let's go. So Pat can tell many stories about this as well because she was there with us. And um, so how many years later and, you know, since uh, 96 and, and we still haven't yet confirmed that site, right? And we crawl through brambles and we crawl through brush and oh my gosh, it, it was something. But we, I think we have a pretty good idea where the site is and it's on my to-do list. I, I hope we get back down there to confirm that site location at some point. Um, I, I, I think we have a good shot at it. Uh, and a lot of THC people work with us on that. So that's another one of my favorite um, sites to work to. Um, as far as that, then Smitty said, oh, we've got this other site in Tonkwo Bank in, in the city park. And so Ann had done some work with Smitty at that site. And so they invited me down and we did a little bit more work. And then in 97, uh, Tom, who was doing the TAS field school, and Dr. Tamara Walter, who was doing the work out at, at the Mission Valley site. She'll talk about that, I'm sure. Um, we kind of teamed together, and I sort of led the work at Tonkwa Bank for what I believe to be the second site of the mission, uh, Espiritu Santo. And so we, we worked there. Um, Kathleen came down and joined us in that work. She also, she and Ed Jelts, uh, the well-known Dr. Ed Jelks, who had worked together for so many years, came down. And the one picture that you show is, is one I treasure dearly and will all my life, the rest of my life. It was with Kathleen and Ed at Tonko Bank with me. I cherish that photograph and that memory of having been there with them. So we did two seasons of field work there. Um, and and that, was, that was great. Um, GAS, as we said, you know, part of what you, I think part of your career is those relationships that, that you make with those nonprofit groups and with those other groups. So that was a great experience, even though one day it was literally 114 degrees 
in the field. And I think, oh my gosh, you know, I, I can do it then, but not sure I'd want to do it now, right? But uh, that, that was great. And yeah. again, you, you're hearing this, a lot of the same names through, right? You can see how these people are, are influencing you and supporting you through, through your career. And of course, worked with, with Pat many times at, at the THC on this. And uh, we have a really good got stuck in the rain story <laughs> down along the Garcetas Creek, too. That was an experience. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, um, then um, in uh, I think around 99, um, I could have that date a little bit off. But anyway, when the Texas Historical Commission started looking and going back to re reinvestigate the Fort St. Louis site, uh, Kathleen invited me to be a part of that. And so once again, I owe so much of, of what I got to do uh, to her for her bringing me in and involving me in that project. And that was just such an incredible project. Oh my gosh, it was one of the best times of my life being able to go down there and spend so much time with Kathleen, with Dr. Jim Bruceth and with all the field crew and everybody that was participating. I think one of the things that I really, really, really learned from Kathleen and what she always drove home to me was don't be afraid to be wrong. Ask questions. You know, it, it, it doesn't hurt to be wrong. Throw it out, throw the hypothesis out, and then let's work through them. So that was another real great learning experience for me. And so I kind of followed that, you know, I think the, for the rest of my career, maybe to some people's consternation because I you know sometimes you just can't afraid to be wrong right because you're not going to get the answer if you are so anyway we we worked on that project so that that was great fun um in 2003 I was hired by the city of San Antonio as a it was a planner position at that time and I owe a lot of that credit to another male archaeologist Herb Eckert who recommended me for the job, but I have an extreme amount of gratitude to Ann McGlone, who hired me for that job. And I will be forever grateful for that. And uh, then I also worked with Shannon Miller uh, after Ann had, had um, left that position and moved on. But two great uh, female role models uh, to get to work for. Um, part of my job at the city then in 2008, we actually literally created a city archaeologist position. So I'm very proud of, of having made that happen. I think some of the other things are, you know, we had the city of San Antonio has a unified development code, but it needed to be strengthened. And working with, um, you know, through my career, and I always heard about, you know, the conflict between developers, engineers, archaeologists, and I thought, you know, can we do better? Let, let's see if we can do better. So tried to start forming some of those relationships. And, and in doing so, we were able to get past um, ordinances through the UDC that allowed development, uh, archeological investigation on private development projects. So I think San Antonio is one of the few cities in the nation that actually allowed development on, on private lands uh, or require it actually. We were also able to work with, um, I, I worked very closely with John Cantu at the city of San Antonio, who then at the city started forming um, a department called TCI, Transportation and Capital Improvements. And John formed an environmental component to that division. So we worked very closely to make sure that we incorporated archeological investigations into all, all city projects as per the law. And so, um, Frequently, I was joining, in the early days, I was probably the only woman uh, in many of those meetings, uh, you know, with, with other city people. Now, that has changed. There, there are a lot more women in those meetings now. But, um, you know, so some of the funny stories is that, you know, I would always say, they would say, well, well why do you have to do it? Why do we have to do this? I'm saying, because it's the law, you know. And at one point, I got called in by um, an assistant director who said, we don't want to hear you say that anymore. And I said, okay, well then you tell your engineers to quit asking me why they have to do it. So one thing I learned is as a female in those positions, you better have a backbone of steel and you better not back down because if you show any sign of weakness, you're done. So my philosophy on it was, and it's still my same philosophy today, is I don't care whether you liked me or not, 
but as long as you respected me and as long as I could do my job, and my job was to protect the resource, whatever that was. It wasn't to make you happy. It wasn't to make anybody else happy. It was to protect the resource. So I, I tried to kind of stand firm on that. Um, some of the projects of the city that are my favorite that, that I got to work on um, would be Main Plaza. We started that renovation in 2007. It was a major project for the city of San Antonio. Uh, worked with a lot of great archeologists. Um, Casey Hansen led that, um, that work down at Main Plaza. I think one of the most exciting things that we found uh, during the course of that um, was a fortification entrenchment that was related to the siege of Bear and uh, possibly also to the Battle of Alma. And so that was a, a real highlight. Um, there, there was a story one time about where I got called out to city council to have to answer some questions about it. And I'd been in the trench and it had rained the night before. So I was literally covered in mud. I am not joking, covered in mud. I called Ann up at the time and I said, Ann, they've called me to city council and I'm filthy. And she just, she said, it's great, go. <laughs> Oh, I did. I grew up, you know, at city council with my muddy boots and jeans. But anyway, uh, also Hemisphere Plaza would be a highlight, I, I think, of my career uh, working at the city. Uh, that was another project that, that um, I think was in part of. And then Alamo Plaza in 2016. And that was working with, uh, we brought together what we call the dream team of archaeologists. We brought together um, Center for Archaeological Research, and we brought together um, Robert Kistner and Dr. Nesta Anderson, who was with Pike Dawson. And uh, Nesta is absolutely one of my favorite young archaeologists working in the field right now. I think she does a great job. And so we were able to do those investigations at the Alamo. So that, that was a highlight. And then in 2013, um, they were starting to do some work along the San Pedro Creek. And so um, I was out, you know, wandering around that day and was told, well, Ann Fox thought that the site was probably up the Christopher Columbus Italian Society headquarters in that area. So I met Frank Monaco of the, the Italian Society. And so they, I got permission to survey and went out and walked out across the, the parking lot. And I looked down and here are all these artifacts eroding. And so it, it, we call it the probable site because it's, it's not proved up 100% yet, right? And uh, the site had been, it had been a borrow area for TxDOT and everything else, but there are artifacts that possibly relate to the first site. Many people don't realize that there are three sites to Mission San Antonio de Valera. And this would be the 1718 and first site. Uh, so that was exciting. We brought in the Conservation Society, gave us some grant money. We brought in CAR do that work. And so there were two field seasons there. We worked with city council, worked with the mayor. Uh, everybody came, kind of came on board for this project as, as well as the, the Italian society who were just wonderful to work with. Um, so that was, that was really a, a great project. Um, got to work on a lot of Asakias. I mean, you know, those were, were great projects. To get, to, you know, so many different, different projects, but those were some, I think, of the ones that meant the most to me. Um, and, and I think part of, of that was the, the ability to work with developers and engineers and other city people to, to try to explain and, and help them understand that, you know, that we don't do this just because we want to, right? There are federal and state laws that require this type of, of uh, investigation when you're doing projects. Um, so that, that was part of my experience, I think, of, of working at the city. Um, I, I retired in 2019. And before that, we brought on a, a young archaeologist, Matt Elverson, um, who worked um, as an assistant uh, underneath me. And uh, Matt is now one of two city archaeologists. I'm very proud of him. He's doing a great job there in San Antonio. And so, um, you know, you, I, I think that you know, I was thinking about this and I thought, well, what are the things that I, I would say and recommend? And I think that number one, as a female, I think you have to be pretty tough. You know, you, you really have to be strong. You have to be really committed. Um, I think you have to appreciate your worth, which I don't really think I did at the beginning. So my advice to young women would be, um, you know, appreciate what you're worth and ask for it. Because if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. 
So, you know, stand up for yourself, right? And, and know your worth. Um, and at the city, I, I think another thing that I, I think about throughout my career is those friendships and the colleagues that you make very early in your career become the people that you may work with for your entire career. And I just, I have been so incredibly blessed and so fortunate to have worked with great people, you know, come into mind, Mark Denton, Pat at THC, um, Skipper at the core, you know, we, we had all known each other for many years. We, we, we knew we could trust each other and, and, and we had each other's backs, you know, um, and, and knowing that you could trust that this person was going to do, try to do the right thing as much as possible. So I think to me, that's sort of uh, uh, something that I wanted to, to say. Um, you know, and, and just getting to work with great people. Pat was always so available to us and always had our back and, and was so able to, to help make things happen there. So, uh, I, you know, it's just really important, um, I think, to, to have those, those relationships. And um, truly, 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 um, I believe, you, you know, your success really is so dependent upon the great people that you work with. Like, you know, I've worked so much with, Tamara's one of my idols. Um, you know, working with her has just been great and wonderful. And I think she's doing some of the most fantastic work um, of, of any of us is everything that she's doing and what she's being able to accomplish. Um, haven't worked with Mary Beth as much, but certainly through, through collections and everything did out at Carr and, and at Tarl. But so I feel like I've worked with, with each of these other um, speakers quite a bit. And um, certainly now with, 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 the, with you, Becky, and, and uh, with everyone there at TH, really do appreciate that. Um, you know, I just, I, I think that there are so many things that, um, that as a female, that you, you just kind of have to, um, I think you have to be really strong. And I, I think you have to look to those people who are willing, whether they're male or female, uh, you know, to mentor you and, and to appreciate what you do. And um, I have to say, I, I, I never really felt like I had difficulty um, with that. I, I just feel like I've been very lucky and very blessed. And uh, even though I'm retired, um, I don't plan on sitting sitting at home and, and doing nothing. I have some other projects that I really would like to accomplish. And so hopefully some of those will come about. So that's kind of what I have to say. Well, thank you, Kay. That is, I really like your conversation. And I know we'll talk more about um, the tools of success or the relationships that you make early on in your career and you continue. And, and pushing outside of your industry, we're trained as archaeologists, but one of my mentors taught me how to read engineering drawings, which was a game changer when I had to sit down at the table with all the engineers and understand yes. what they were doing so I could explain to them why we had to do what we had to do. <laughs> I've got one question for you in the chat that I think we can answer live. I know you touched on this, but uh, Jean Crane is asking whether it's common or not for cities to have an archaeologist on staff. No, it is not. And, and that is something that um, certainly I think that more cities need, need to do. Uh, it, it really facilitates development for them. And, and hearing Jean's name, I, I think I, I failed to mention, and I wanted to mention some of the nonprofit groups that, that really helped me throughout my career. The Texas Historical Foundation, I mentioned them when I was talking about the search for the Mission Sense of Law, providing funding for us. Um, they have been an incredible organization to work with. The San Antonio Conservation Society. Um, I've worked very closely with uh, what's called the Farm and Ranch Committee of the San Antonio Conservation Society. Let me tell you, those women are magnificent. Uh, I'd have to call out Joanna Parrish, uh, Marlene Richardson, Patty Zell. If you, if you ever wanted to work with some great women, those women are wonderful to work with. Um, also, you know, with the TAS, uh, SDAA, I've been a long-term member of the Southern Texas Archaeological Association, working with that group. So I think those, you know, I, I think, you know, volunteer, get, get out and volunteer. Um, and that, a lot, a lot of times that leads you into a position. 
uh, through your volunteer activity. And that comes to a lot of these organizations. So yeah, no, there are not very many um, cities that have them. I, I really think that's something we should concentrate on is trying to, to um, get other cities to hire city archeologists. And Kay, another question came in um, about, and that you actually partially answered it just a minute ago, but what advice would you give women who are looking to connect with mentors such as yourself or others in the field? And you mentioned stay involved, get involved with the societies, but also yes. you know, other preservation minded groups that you mentioned that are not necessarily archeological, but they're right. about history and culture in that community. Um, Absolutely. County Historical Commissions, or I started in the County Historical Commission um, many, many, many years ago. And that was a great, great place to learn a lot about preservation. Um, you know, so there, there are all sorts of, of activities like that and, uh, and, and organizations that, that you can join and, and learn and then partner up with. And, and I, I think the hope of all of us on this panel today, I, I know it's it's always been a goal of mine and um, I get kind of emotional talking about it, but because of people like Dr. Kathleen Gilmore, who were so wonderful and so encouraging and so uplifting and so supportive that, you know, I, I think each of us would say that we hope in some small way that each of us can pass that on, right? There, there's always a saying that my mama said that love goes forward. Well, I like to think that, you know, that our ability to help others and that we, we, can, we can pass that forward, right? And that we can share that with other young and upcoming archeologists. Um, I, I hope in some small way that, that I've been able to do that because I think that's where your real legacy becomes. Who are those that you've helped mentor? Who are those you've helped along the way? Thank you, Kay. I think, I think that's... That's a big part of it is these relationships. Well, I think we'll allow Mary Beth to share a part of her history with us. Once again, she'll she'll be able to connect the dots more with some of the ladies we, we introduced earlier. Uh, yeah, um, let me start out by saying I'm another one of those outsiders like Pat. I came from uh, the great state of New York to the great state of Texas, um, and, but consider myself mostly Texan, I would think. Um, but I came here to, to study archaeology at, at UT, um, got my, my bachelor's and my master's through UT, uh, was very much influenced by Tarl and started working out there under my professor, uh, Jim Neely, that some of you may know, um, as an undergraduate. And so, you know, the mentors that come to mind when I think of, you know, who started me on this path. I have to go back to my parents. My parents were just like, um, you want to do that? Okay, fine, go. You know, they, you know, there was never any discouragement. There was just, if you love it, do it. I mean, that was my dad's words. If you love it, do it. Um, and I'm sure they held their breath for a couple of years while I was first, first doing it. Um, so Jim Neely would be a male, a male mentor. Um, but then at Tarl, you know, Deanne was the director when I started out there. And so she, I mean, she was up there going, you know, here I am doing my job, but, you know, never being pushy about it, just doing her job. But she was a role model. Um, Carolyn Spock, I got to know her when I was an undergraduate. And she said, well, you got to do two things. You got to join the Council of Texas Archaeologists and you've got to join TAS and get involved. It wasn't a, you should, or you might want to think about it. it was, you need to. And uh, so that I, I push that on, on students and everything that I, that I deal with. At the same time as I was starting graduate school, I worked with Solvay and that was, that was really neat to, to work with a, another very strong woman as, as Kay says, they're strong women. Um, then I went into the private sector. No, I went to Parks and Wildlife for a while. Then I went into the private sector um, and collections started to becoming more and more important for me. That I felt like that's where I could um, leave a mark or at least make some changes. Um, 
And a lot of that was dependent because I wanted to have a family and I didn't see how I was going to um, balance motherhood and career of field work. So doing lab work was a good compromise. I could still stay involved that way. Um, so there was Art Black at um, Parks and Wildlife, who's now retired. He taught me historic archeology. span uh, Cynthia Banks, some of you may know of Cynthia. She was the first black archeologist in Texas that I ever knew about. And uh, she tried to teach me glass and historic ceramics analysis, which I didn't really get um, until Ann nailed it through my head finally. Um, so Parks and Wildlife, to about 94. Then I went to the private sector for a bunch of years and um, got reacquainted with Mike Quigg who had been working with my husband in the private sector. Um, and he was a very good mentor. He was showing me the personal side. How do you, how do you make relationships work? Um, because I tend to be very blunt and very honest. And so getting me to kind of tamper that down and still get my message across. Um, but I think the best mentors of all was being a part of UT and Tarle in the 70s and 80s when there were so many people doing research out there and so many graduate students that I got to, to, um, to interact with. Uh, Nancy Kenmatsu is one of the, the people that comes to mind. You know, she just, you know, she was out there as a graduate student and did things, Dave Robinson, um, a whole, a whole sleep suite of, of people, but mostly men. But I did see that, you know, if you're a strong woman, you can, you can keep getting what you want. Um, after working in the private sector for a while, um, moved to San Antonio where my husband had been working and, um, was given the title of lab coordinator for, um, Center for Archaeological Research, uh, UTSA. And that was just because Bob Hart at the time, who was the director, did not want to take a title away from Ann. Even though I was doing Ann's job and trying to expand the job that, that she had been doing for all those years, I did everything with Ann's blessing because she was the one who knew those collections and was could help me with that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of hurdles and stuff, well, after UTSA, I ended up back at Tarl, back home. I came back home um, and back to some people who are still working there, like Rosario Caceres, that some of you may know. Um, we, we laugh about the old days when we were young and foolish and didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into. Um, in terms of hurdles, there really weren't that many hurdles other than things like you can't do lithics because the women do ceramics. And I heard that as an undergrad and I was like, um, no, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. I'm gonna do whatever material analysis I wanna do. I'm gonna do whatever theory I wanna do. You're not telling me anything, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. Um, and the only other one is probably more of a self-imposed one. And that goes back to um, wanting to have a family. And so having a husband in the PhD program both of us couldn't do it and have kids. So, you know, we, we worked it out. And as it turns out, having a master's person and having a PhD person works out good for, for, for keeping employed. Um, you know, in terms of what were impactful kinds of things, um, because I was around Tarl as an undergraduate, this uh, call came in one Friday afternoon that they had found some human bone in Wharton County. And uh, did you take osteology last semester? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to go come out with us and look at this site? I was like, sure. So, you know, that was my field, first field experience. And that was in, oh, that was 40 years ago, a couple months ago. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> um, so I had my first field experience doing that. And then, um, I got to do field work at Nan Ranch with Harry Schaefer, another name people people know. Um, that was fun being on a, a, a dig for six weeks with a whole group of Aggies. Um, 
lots of Aggie jokes were thrown back and forth and they were mostly Harry trying to see if he was gonna get me killed or not for laughing at his Aggie jokes. Um, trying to think of other things that were impactful. Um, Neely definitely was because he just let me do what I wanted to do and as long as I could support it, he was he was out there. And I got quiet support from, from everybody else. Um, you know, I think they saw that I wasn't gonna back down. Um, another theme that Kay was talking about is if you're strong enough and you have the backbone and you're gonna do it and you push for it and you know what you're talking about and you can support what you're talking about, they're gonna listen to you. They may not like what you're gonna say, but they're gonna listen to you. Um, Carolyn instilled in me that it's the resource, like also like what Kay was saying, it's the resource we're trying to protect. So, you know, if everything I say is in support of that resource, they can argue with me, but they're not going to be right because I'm, I'm protecting the resource. Um, tools of success. That's one of the things that Becky said she would like us to talk about. Um, I would say stubbornness, just plain dog stubbornness. Um, just you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Um, I thought that was also go, goes along with being a short woman, but I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it. But stubbornness definitely, definitely does. Um, perseverance, don't give up. If you have a setback, just go for it again. Collect yourself and go for it again. Um, I think honesty has a lot to do with getting where I am. Um, people always know what I stand for. Um, and I tried to give that to the students that I work with too, of, okay, you want to do archeology? span You know, there's not much money in it. You're probably not going to get very far, but if you love it, do it. So that harkens back to some of what my dad said. If you love it, do it. Um, but giving back, again, another, um, another thing that, that Kay said is, because I had such great mentors, and Carolyn, Deanne, um, Nancy Kenmatsu as, a, as, a, as an undergrad, um, that whole group of graduate students that were out at Tarl in, in the 70s and 80s, they showed me how, even though you might be in a group that is all striving for the same type of position, you can support each other. You can help each other through things. And then you just keep pushing. But one part of that is you learn, they helped me, I got to help others. And so, you know, that's why I do what I do with all the interns and the volunteers that we get at Tarl with the TAS involvement. And God, I'm on like five committees with TAS, I think these days, it's too much. Um, but I can't say no, you know, when they, when they hit me at the heart, I can't say no. Um, CTA stuff, I've been doing curation committee chair for I don't know how many years now. Um, but I just keep pushing it and keep doing things that I love to do. And I hope that people can see through my stubbornness and my maybe anger that they don't quite understand what I'm trying to teach them, that it's all coming from a passion place. It's Archaeology and collections are my passion. And, um, you know, we got to share it because if we don't take care of it, it's not going to be around forever. And I love all these women on, on, on the panel here, have worked with all of them. Um, Ta Tamara was a master's student, I guess, when I first met you. At no, you were getting ready to go to your master's program. You were getting ready to go to your master's program. Uh, dating myself a little bit here. Um, Becky, I knew when she was in the private sector. Um, Pat and I have served on committees together. And Kay, I spent 14 years in, in San Antonio. I mean, how could I not know who Kay was? Um, and lots of records in Tarl and Carr and Tarl's files that are produced by all these people. Um, so I think Pat, you were the one that said you were honored or somebody said they were honored at the beginning. Yeah, I'm, I'm very honored to be um, a part of this, but I wanna pay homage to people like Anne and Carolyn and 
Ellen Sue that I got to work with a little bit. The, those people who came before us, they're really important. And Solveig, God rest her soul. Yeah. Mary Beth, I've got um, a question for you um, from the Q&A. Okay. Um, you worked, you know, at a couple different universities and private sector. Um, the question is, what was your favorite job? <laughs> My favorite job. It's a loaded question, right? It is a very loaded question. I love parts of all of those jobs that I had. Um, I said parts of walleye was fun because I learned historic. Car was great because I learned Spanish colonial. Um, but I think Tarl is my favorite because I've come back home and I am in charge of and directing moving Tarl and keeping Tarl relevant. Re yeah. I can't even say the relevant. That's the word relevant um, because we're trying to make our collections more accessible to students. But so I would say probably Tarl is my favorite job. But you know, just thought of it. I, I did get to dig a Spanish colonial site in, in Floresville, Rancho de los Cabras for several years. And that was so much fun. Um, so I like them all. <laughs> but I will retire from par in five or six years if I can afford it. Until then, I'm still around and still causing trouble, I'm sure. Don't stop. Don't stop. Thank you. <laughs> We've got one more question and uh, you already touched on this a little bit, but I know that we'll continue this. Um, so Tamara, it's, we'll, we'll get you started, but um, the question that comes up and I know you're gonna address this because we've talked about it in the past, having a family and being an active archeologist is a huge hurdle. Mm -hmm. Do you have any words of advice and encouragement for those young females out there who may be having some hesitancy on the field family balance? I'd say rely on your spouse, rely on your partner. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. And and I, if I can speak for Tamara, I know she's got a good one in her partner. And I definitely have one. Well, Tamara, would you like to um, share some of your career history and some some guidance for our group of listeners. Okay. Ah, there we go. I'm muted. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to be a part of this. I also feel very honored to be uh, among this great group of women. And thank you for to, to the audience too for tuning in. Um, when I was looking over some of the things that you were saying, wanted us to talk about, I started to think about my career and how it all started. Um, when I was in high school thinking about you know where I wanted to go to college, the one thing I, I remember my parents telling me is how important an education was, a college education. But in particular, I remember my dad telling me, whatever you do, uh, the one thing you should always be is financially independent, meaning don't rely on a man. <laughs> and and um, I didn't know if he thought that, that archaeology was a good career choice in that regard or not, but that's where I ended up. Uh, I had a love of history since I can remember. My parents used to take us all over the United States and we would visit historic sites and that really, um, I guess it really ignited a passion in me. So when I began um, my studies at the University of Texas at Austin in the late 80s, uh, I, I declared myself an anthropology, archaeology major, and I, I never looked back. Um, I, my first field school was in New Mexico um, with uh, Jim Neely, and that summer was probably one of the best summers of my life, and I knew this is what I want to do. You know, it's interesting. I, I was trying to think about female. I also think about all the women that have influenced me and been mentors to me. I don't recall in my undergrad education at UT um, any female professors. I think they were all male. Uh, it really wasn't until after I got out. I graduated in 1991 and, and I began work as a contract archaeologist. Um, so it wasn't until I was I was out 
and working as a professional archaeologist that um, I saw female archaeologists archaeologist in positions of authority. Uh, my very first uh, contract project was with Pruitt, and um, my first crew chief was Margaret Howard. <laughs> so that was really great to, to, to have a, a, a female leading up a project. Um, I, I also worked at Wilson Leonard, and the interesting thing about that project, there are many interesting things about that project. <laughs> I worked there for the summer. I wasn't there the whole time, but I met some great women. Um, I'd already known Ina Dodge, but I met Valentina Martinez and Dorothy Lippert. Uh, Gail was working there at, at Tarl at the time. I don't know if Mary Beth was at Tarl then or not. I can't quite remember. Um, but, you know, these women have continued to work and most of them have continued to work and have really fruitful careers in archaeology. But one thing I remember about that project that still irks me to this day is that they were taking a lot of archaeo mag samples and they had this drill that they were using to drill into uh, burned rock features. They would not let the women use it. That was the rule. We could not use the drill. At the end of my stint there, which was late summer because I was taking another job, they let one woman use the drill. And I can tell you right now, no blood was shed <laughs> or no accidents. <laughs> um, so I still think about that. After that, I, I started a, a, a much longer project. And I think this is where I, I, I met Mary Beth with um, Mariah, which is then became TRC Mariah. And then it's TRC at Fort Hood. And one of hands down the best crew chiefs that I ever had, male or female, was Jemma Mahalchek. I mean, I can't even say enough good things about her. Uh, she was unbelievable. Uh, she could get any stuck vehicle out of the mud. Um, she was so competent and just so calm during a crisis. And um, I, I look up, back at those times fondly. I also met my husband during that project. So that was also another highlight. Um, so, and oh, I also worked with Abby Treese and I think she was at one time a PI at uh, Mariah, but you know, those positions, the positions of crew chiefs and PIs were re very rarely held by women. Um, I, I think that's changed somewhat. I hope it has. I haven't been in contract work for a long, long time, but I remember that there was kind of this unspoken rule that, you know, yeah, well, you, uh, one or two women can have these, but let's not get crazy. Um, so this was kind of something that you kind of knew. <laughs> um, I uh, realized that if I wanted to, to continue my career in, in, in archaeology, I needed to go back for uh, a master's degree. And so I wanted to do high plains archaeology, and I ended up at the University of Montana. And it was there that for the very first time I had, in academics anyways, a female mentor. And that was my advisor, thesis advisor, Dr. Susan DeFrance. And thank God for her because she saved me from Northern Plains archaeology. Sorry for those of you who do that. <laughs> but she introduced me to historical archaeology and in particular Spanish colonial archaeology, for which I'm forever grateful because uh, I just fell in love with it. And um, I didn't have a project. I remember I needed a thesis project. And so I was trying to think, you know, I really love to excavate a site, but where am I, how am I gonna do this? So I decided to call up Jim Neely and I asked him, you know, hey, by any chance, you don't have any sites or anything, or know anybody that has any sites that I could work on? He said, no, but you might ask Tom Hester. Well, <laughs> I know this is, sounds crazy, but I had not taken any classes with Dr. Hester as an undergrad. So when I approached him, I wasn't sure. Uh, first of all, this person from, from uh, Montana uh, is asking me for, for a project. Well, he responded right away and he had this project uh, down in Mission Valley, um, Espiritu Santo. And that was the mission that uh, I ended up working on for my master's and then later on for my dissertation. And um, Dr. Hester was uh, one of these great male mentors in my life. And I don't think I would be where I am today without him, just like Kay has mentioned all the things he's done. And I think 
I have a little bit of insight into that. I, I remember him talking to me about Deanne's story and saying how badly he felt that here she was a mentor to him, but at one point in time, he actually had to write a recommendation letter for her, you know, and I think he was really sensitive to that. And um, as a result, I, I, I think that that he um, was always supportive of women. And at least that was my own experience. And he was certainly good to me. And another great thing about Tom Hester is that he introduced me to two of my most favorite people in the world. And that was, of course, Kathleen Gilmore and Kay Hines. And uh, they couldn't have been kinder to me. And they introduced me to this whole community. Um, and they shared knowledge. I mean, that's the thing. They, they were unselfish about that. Um, they were always encouraging. And Kathleen, my gosh, that woman had so much intellectual curiosity uh, right up until the day she died. I mean, we had plans. You know, uh, when her daughter called me and said, well, she's in the hospital. I said, okay, well, when's she going to get out? Because we've got stuff to do. I often forgot, but this woman's in her 90s. Um, and I think it was just, you know, both Kay and I, was, we, we weren't ready for her to go. We had a lot to, 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 uh, to do and, and so much to learn from her. But I think the one thing I did, my, I, I learned many things from her. But one thing that I think sticks with me is just that she never stopped wanting to learn more and never stopped ask, asking questions. Uh, and I love that about her. And I hope I'm like that if I make it to the ripe old age of 94 or 95 uh, when she passed away. Um, I also got to meet, albeit briefly, Marta Schutz, and I got to work with Ann Fox um, and, and other great female archaeologists like Jenny Mack. Uh, it was just a great community um, that I felt like, oh, I'm, I'm part of this. And uh, in addition to that, I was also introduced to the Texas Archaeological Society. And I've been involved with them pretty much ever since. Um, they did a, a field school out at uh, Espiritu Santo, I think in 94, 95, uh, and helped me collect my dissertation data. Um, after I finished at the University of Montana, uh, I, uh, upon the encouragement of, of Tom Hester, I applied to the PhD program, got in with his support, and continued to work at Espiritu Santo, for which I, um, I wrote up my, my dissertation. But the TAS was instrumental in that. And, and I'll say this again, I know I've said it to y'all before, that is a place where we can really make a difference when it comes to, to young female up, up and coming archeologists and, and little kids. Um, the fact that we have uh, the youth program and that young boys and girls are seeing women as PIs, as crew chiefs, uh, you're, make, you're normalizing that. So these kids are seeing that, oh, okay, this is, totally normal to have a woman in charge of this. Um, I think that's really, really important. And that's something that I've really loved about uh, TAS. So um, upon uh, my almost completion of, I was ABD, uh, finishing up writing my dissertation uh, about um, Spiritu Santo, I applied for this job here at Texas Tech. Um, and so I have, I have a, you know, some perspective on the academic side of this, which is a little bit different maybe than what, I don't know, maybe some of you have experienced this too, but uh, it was sort of an eye opener for me. But I, I applied for the, the position and um, I was ABD at the time. So I was, I, I did get the job, but there was uh, a, a, um, a catch. Um, they were concerned that uh, I would not be able to complete my um, PhD and they did not want to give me a tenure track position without the PhD in hand. So they told me, okay, well, you know, we'll offer you uh, a year as a visiting professor. If you finish your, your PhD in that time, then your tenure, when we'll offer you the tenure position. So I thought about it and I thought, well, if nothing else, I'll get teaching experience. But I was bound and determined to get my PhD finished and did finish my dissertation and defended that that fall. Um, and uh, the tenure clock started for me the following fall. Uh, when I arrived here at Texas Tech, 
there were no female full professors. Our department is blended. It's uh, sociology, anthropology, and social work. There weren't that many women throughout our, our department. Uh, there was only myself and a cultural anth female cultural anthropologist, and then a handful of women in the other areas. So there wasn't a big group of us. And it was also kind of, you know, hey, it's a, this is a good old boys club with the, the full professor thing. So it's probably not something you should think about. Um, again, sort of an unsaid thing. Um, it's just, now here it is, I've been here 20 years. Oh my God, I can't believe it. <laughs> and just within the last five years, we've had our first two female full professors, just to show you the glacial change <laughs> that's occurring here. Um, but one story I wanted to relate about all of that was when I, when I, uh, after I got, I finished, like I told them, I said, no, I'm finishing in December. About two years after that, they were interviewing a, a male a associate. Well, they were they were interviewing for a a position, a tenure track position in sociology, and there was a one male candidate they really liked, and he was ABD. And of course, now this at this point in time, I could hear all the conversations about the hiring and 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 um, and negotiating about all of that because I was I was uh, privy to that now being on the faculty. Uh, and I was shocked that they were not going to force this guy to be uh, to be a visiting professor. Um, they were going to give him a tenure track position and they were going to give him a very large salary. <laughs> so, you know, these are some of the things that 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 are just, you know, you you think, gosh, how, how can this be happening? Um, but I think Kay is absolutely right. You have to stand up. And a lot of us stood up and said, look, this is not correct. Uh, that. A gentleman ended up leaving after a few years and uh, allegedly took a, a, a computer with him. So I think <laughs> the university lost out on that one. Um, so, you know, these are things that I think as women we do experience and whether you're in archaeology or, or some other career, but it was sort of an eye opener on how all of this, this uh, system works within academics, full professorship and all of that. Um, but you know, in, in terms of, of tools or, or uh, tools of success, I think you know, all of all the women on the panel today have hit on a lot of the key things. Uh, community and support, supporting one another is so important and making room for these new archaeologists that are coming up. Because I can tell you right now, the women or the, or the programs with archaeology, they are mostly women. Um, most of my classes now are full of women. Undergrad and graduate uh, students are female. And so we're going to have to be carving out a spot for these women um, in positions of authority and power. Things are going to have to shift. Um, and, you know, I think about Kathleen and uh, Deanne Story um, and Solvay, all these trailblazers. We're walking in the path that they forged for us. And I, I think one of our major jobs is to make sure that we um, are making the path even a, a little bit easier for the women that are coming behind us. And that means supporting them, um, making sure that we provide a, a hand up and that we're there for them uh, because they're gonna need us. <laughs> it's, it's, we're not yet there. Uh, we still have a, a road to travel. so. Um, trying to think if I've, I've left anything out, but that's sort of been been my experience. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll mention one thing about being a mother. That's hard. It's hard for any working mom. If you don't have a, a supportive spouse, um, it's even harder. I don't know how single women do it. Uh, in addition to having the pressures of, of, of a full-time career and being a mom, you also have societal, societal pressure. You know, when my husband when I when my husband takes the kids to to the uh, doctor, they'll ask, "Where's your wife?" <laughs> and when I take the kids, they never ask me where my husband is. <laughs> so it's 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 things like that, you know, that just drive you crazy. So society has certain ideas about our role as women and what we should and shouldn't be doing, and you know, uh, traditional gender roles are shifting now, which is a good thing. Um, Okay, so I took notes, <laughs> trying to make sure I hit all the points. But one more thing, and I promise I'll shut up. But 
it isn't just about helping women, uh, which is also very, very key, but it's also about how we do archaeology, I think, is another thing that, that we need to, to be cognizant of. We have to make sure that we're giving women a voice in the past. Right, women were there, and uh, oftentimes they're overshadowed by the male narratives that have, have commonly dominated these conversations <laughs> about the past. Um, not that they're they're not important. It's just that hey, you know, maybe maybe we can balance that picture out a little bit. So addressing the archaeological record with the uh, with a recognition that hey, <laughs> women were there too. We were a part of, of history and making sure that we're aware of that when we approach any archeological site. So that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. Well, you've hit on some really important points. And, you know, I think um, there's one a question that I was holding from earlier um, and you've touched on this in academia for sure, but um, this really is an open question for all of y'all is comparing your career experiences from when you started until now, have you noticed any changes in attitudes towards women in, he says, in this field, but I also think literally in the field, um, because that's, that's, that's an important distinction to make. Um, do any of y'all want to make any additional comments on that from where we started? Jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, in my early career as an archaeologist, I can't tell you how many times I would arrive in the field, um, particularly when I was assigned a project as a crew chief or a project archeologist. And inevitably you were working with engineering firms or you know, city officials, county officials, almost all of them were men. And they're like, oh, they didn't really know what to expect. And I walk in, number one, I'm a woman, number two, a woman of color <laughs> and they're like didn't it it threw people off which I have to admit I kind of took advantage of because they didn't really have boxes to put me in as easily so um you know there was that it, it was the unexpected um now that could work against you you know it's like well I can't believe her husband lets you do this <laughs> oh no 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 <laughs> That's not the way this works. Um, but also, sometimes being underestimated can be to your advantage, because if you're a strong person who knows what they're doing, knows the job that needs to be done, you can get a lot accomplished when people don't think that you're up for it. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times that the Texas Historical Commission, when I had meetings with um, various folks, developers and such that um, were really not too happy about the law that was forcing them to do the archaeological work that they were having to to delay their projects for, you know, poor planning and a lot of time uh, in a lot of cases. But, uh, you know, inevitably they would come in, you know, guns a blazing thinking they were going to intimidate me. And it's like, yeah, no, mm -mm. <laughs> that's not going to happen. I know the law, I know what needs to be done. So there's that. Um, but also being able to, to learn how to be a leader doesn't come naturally to a lot of people, men and women. And so I'd like to throw out one, one little bit that I meant to touch on earlier. That you've heard us talking about the TAS, the Texas Archaeological Society. Not only does it give you experience in the field, in the lab, at various locations across the state, exposes youth to, um, to the amazing resources that we have in Texas. The organization and many other nonprofits like it that are volunteer-based offer opportunities to learn how to be a leader. I was I was nominated in 1989 and elected as the president of the Texas Archaeological Society. I was so young <laughs> that I didn't know what hit me. But you know what? I hit the ground running and I had a lot of support from a lot of people. Um, folks that were just excited that somebody was willing to take on the responsibility and you learn 
by doing. You, you learn from your mistakes and believe me, I'm, I've made some, but you know what? Men do that too. And that's usually not held against them all that long. So you learn and uh, networking, another thing that comes out of that, those groups. Uh, it, it's, it's just one of those things that I cannot stress enough that if you have the ability and the chance to become involved, you're gonna get so much more out of it, not just the archeology span part of things, but learning how to be a leader, how to work together, how to collaborate, how to share knowledge, how to bring other people up. All of those things embody what I, I took away from the Texas Archaeological Society and many of the regional groups that I've been associated with as well. Yeah, I, I think you have to relate one one story from my past where I took what I'm sure was um, considered aggressive, but was an assertive position. And this was on a project for Parks and Wildlife. Um, we had a person out there monitoring and they hit archeological material. And he said, I got to call Austin. I got to find out what they want me to do. He called back, he called us and we said, no, tell them they're shut down and I'll be there tomorrow. Well, this kid was like a 21 year old, uh, long haired hippie looking guy who shutting down this contractor and the next day comes out a female archaeologist who is going to do this do this project and we weren't allowed to leave before eight o'clock because we were all hourly employees so no overtime we get there and i hear him mum the the project contractor mumbling to himself about oh state employees just taking their old time getting here whenever and i said everybody just unpack i'll be right back and i said look I'm representing Parks and Wildlife and you are on our property and we rule and no, we couldn't leave before eight o'clock. That's what we were told. And would you like me to get back in the truck and shut you down for another day? And he just went, well, no, what, what, uh, no, just tell me when you're ready. Um, any other time I had that kind of situation, it, um, I probably took the passive aggressive point and just did it anyway and just ignored it. But you know, that was one time where I had to get in somebody's face and actually say, no, you know, none of the state employee thing and none of this woman thing you're throwing at me. That's that strong woman thing that we keep talking about. It's it's an important, you know, it's, it's important for us to stand up for ourselves, you know, no matter what industry we in or what role we play. Um, there's a couple of nice comments here in the Q&A that I wanted to share with the panelists. And then uh, another question that we had sent forward earlier uh, from Katie Malone. She says, kudos to all the ladies. No, it is no wonder why my grandmother, Kathleen Gilmore was so proud. You are definitely continuing her legacy. Strong women is what she was all about. Thank you, Katie, that's a really nice comment. And there's, there's some really good feedback from Ruth Van Dyke, uh, speaking specifically on what Tamara was talking about. Um, she's in the Antho Department at Birmingham University in New York. She's the only female full prof in a department of 28 people with 10 full profs in 2021. So they've their department has formed an equity committee, keep fighting. And that's one thing we've talked about offline, but um, women, um, need to continue to put ourselves in those positions of leadership on boards in in the academic if they're if they're not in a leadership position not necessarily in their uh, position in academia but there are boards and committees where you can move that um, dialogue forward so um, thank you for that comment um, we were sent a comment earlier um, before the talk uh, somebody who couldn't make it and y'all touched on this some, but I wanna read this out. What are your thoughts on how to attract more women of color, queer and transgender women with disabilities and other subpopulations of women who are still largely marginalized mm -hmm. from the field of archeology? span um, And then kind of subset of that is what helped you break into the field. I'll open the floor. I'll speak, 
I'll speak to that. Um, I, I think that's so critical. And one of the ways I think that we can do that is community outreach. Um, you know, making sure that particularly if we're working in an area where we've got descendant communities that are affected by whatever we're doing, um, that is so key. Bringing these people into the tent uh, and, um, and not being passive about it, but being active, looking for these folks, because a lot of times they don't even know what archaeology is or what it can 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 do. So I think we've we faltered in that um, in that regard. So reaching out um, through public talks, uh, um, through the TAS, whatever, uh, I, I can't tell you how important I think that is. Thank you, Tamara. And I think that's an important part of our audience. As archaeologists, we get very field centric and we archaeologists like to talk to archaeologists and invite, you know, archaeology societies. But it is important to talk to community groups that are not archaeology related. They may be history related, no. cemetery related. Um, the women's group that meets at the public library once a month. Um, any community groups are um should be introduced to the opportunities, you know, to study art history and preservation. And I do think that we have more opportunities to open doors that way. I also yeah, have, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if, if, if we're just talking to, to each other, we might as well not be doing archaeology, honestly, because it's not going to survive. The past is, belongs to all of us. So we need to do a better job <laughs> of conveying this to the public. I think to, um, not just outreach, but actual recruitment is, is essential. And um, that can take many forms. Um, since I was with the Texas Historical Commission for so long, I'll, I'll um, just point out that there's been an effort for several years with their um, diversity scholarship program, where they bring in students, uh, college students, to work with the staff in the various uh, different divisions and expose them to different career opportunities, um, you know, have them work alongside professionals that they may never have had a chance to meet otherwise. Um, there are many other examples, scholarships. Um, the Texas Archaeological Society has scholarships for Native American participants or diversity uh, applicants for co collegiate uh, applicants. So I, I think you have to be proactive and not reactive. I like that, Pat. Well, that could be our 2021 mission is we're gonna be proactive, not reactive to what the future can hold. Um, I believe that we have covered all the questions in the Q&A and um, I wanted just to open up the floor to see if any of the panelists had any more closing thoughts that you would like to um, share. Um, it has been an absolute honor to visit with you all this afternoon. Thank you for taking the time to share your stories and um, build some excitement for um, this complex career path that each of y'all have cho chosen and really showing all the diversity um, of opportunities that are available. Um, whether it be academics or cultural resource management or really working with, you know, state and federal agencies. I think you touched on each of those career paths and I think it's, it's been really exciting to hear about. Thank you, if I could, I just, and I failed to do it earlier. Um, Sue Turner was, was one of the, the women featured and I, I didn't say enough about Sue. Um, she was just such a wonderful, marvelous mentor for so many of us and such a very quiet, genteel way and um, I think one of the things that always impressed me so about her was you never failed to be with her that she didn't ask you what you were doing she was always interested in you and um, I, you know she was just what she contributed to, to Texas archaeology was tremendous uh, particularly with her partnering with Tom on a stone artifact. So I just wanted to mention Sue because I, I failed to do so earlier and uh, she was a, a wonderful role model for so many of us in such a quiet, genteel way. 
and I'll throw out another comment about um, another woman that was mentioned, uh, Teddy Lou Stigney, um, not in a genteel, quiet way, but she, <laughs> boy, she had passion, has passion still to this day for what she does in the field and was very accepting from the get-go, whether, you know, you met her for the first time, it's like, okay, let's get to work. We're going to do it. And she showed me that uh, being the president of a statewide organization was doable because she had taken on the job early. She had been uh, elected as the president-elect, but her predecessor, uh, Dr. Grant Hall, was going to be Dr. Grant Hall. He went off to uh, graduate school and left the state. So she had to assume that mantle early. And when I saw that she just took it on and then served her term as well, I thought, okay, this must be doable then when, when it came my turn to consider the, the nomination. And she wasn't wrong, you can do it. It's work, but you can do it. Becky, if I could, could I add one other thing? Uh, something else that, that I thought about that, that I think, you know, I've, I've witnessed and seen. It's really funny, but when men are really strong, they're seen as great leaders, right? Sometimes as females, when we do it, I think the term applied to us is difficult and maybe some other terms. And, and I think as females, you know, that, that's a perception that we need to work towards trying to uh, eradicate within the field. Um, strong women um, should be appreciated uh, because that's what it takes, I think, to, to get the job done and to protect the resource. Um, I just wanted to add that. Oh, something else I would like to add. Um, I think the theme of all of us is, as we went along are those relationships that we build, those long-term continuous friendships, both professional and personal. And, and, and I think I'm a little concerned uh, today with maybe seeing a little bit of a movement away from that support that we should all be giving each other, right? And it's concerning to me because I, I think it's a dangerous path to take. And so if I have any, any cautions, you know, I think for anybody is, is to remember that we, we all are going to make mistakes, uh, but we're all in this to preserve the resource. And there, there should be no efforts um, encountered that we should have to face to where we're not being supported. And I think that's incredibly important. If I can follow on that, um, one of the things that we do when we get new interns and, and volunteers out at Tarl is that Annie, my, my colleague and I sit down and we say, you know, we might be busy at our desks, but if you have any questions, networking, graduate school, anything about archeology, span you know, how to balance home life and archeology, span just come, just come ask us. Um, we're trying to give them the tools and there was one student that we've had this last couple of years as, as a work study who was really, really shy when she first came to work for us. And I think we helped her come out of her shell. Um, at least I hope it was us because we gave her lots and lots of encouragement. Um, but it's, yeah, I agree, Kay. It's, it's building those relationships and, and just saying, look, yeah, I'm busy, but I was a hundred years behind when I walked in the door and that's not gonna stop me from helping you, you know, come to us. And maybe that's what we need to do is to, to have um, maybe some mentoring programs at TAS annual meeting. So that, ki that kids, well, they are kids. I mean, I could be their grandmother, um, could come to us and just, and, and just talk, you know? Yeah, maybe just an informal gathering might be useful. That would be really helpful because I think it is navigating a life that goes alongside the career that helps you get the work-life balance as you're building your career. And those things are not, they're not academic related, they're not subject matter focused, but they are 
well, how do you balance it out? Well, how do you manage, you know, being on the road half the year when you're a field tech? Those are, those are good questions. Sarah Chesney just wrote in the Q&A, uh, Sarah Chesney's the site archeologist for San Felipe de Austin, for those of y'all don't know her. She's also the current TAS president. She would love to initiate a TAS mentoring system. So I think we've got something in the works. Thank you, Sarah. Well, without any further ado, um, I think we're wrapping up right when we had anticipated. I really appreciate all of the attendance, all the questions, all the feedback, and y'all's just taking the time to share your stories with us. It's really been wonderful. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you very much. It's good to see everybody's faces again. Yeah, Thanks. maybe next time in person. Say hello to Don for me, Tamara. I will. <laughs> Bye, ladies. He's on dad duty. He's on dad duty, exactly. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Becky. I know we'll see you soon. All right.